Hey, buddy. Good day. Yes, sir. So we're back again. Um, I took a week off because I wasn't feeling that great and had some visitors in town. So uh, we finished out Rule 12 when we were at the beach, and now we're on to Rule 13 in White Magic. Just take it here from the top. It's a pretty short rule, so we... I'm not sure if yeah, we it's make a it. very powerful rule that yeah. when you study white magic for whatever reason, when I, I find myself back at this rule a lot mm -hmm. uh, inside of the when I you know when I'm in this program the you know and I'll type in some keywords it for it, it's it's in there a lot. Uh, so it, it, it's important for sure. It's covering down on a lot of what uh, the common things that I've been searching are in for whatever reason. So looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. So from the top, rule 13. The magician must recognize the four. Note in his work, the shade of violet they evidence and thus constructed the shadow. When this is so, the shadow clothes itself and the four become the seven. Rule 13 yeah. is broken. Yeah, What's that? We, can see, we can see this on the chart, right? The top four, we add to them the lower three. Yep. Right. The four become the seven. Rule 13 is broken out into two subsections, the quaternaries to be recognized and the precipitation of thought forms. So the quaternaries to be recognized. So this rule for me, this rule is for me one of the most difficult to explain. The reason for this being threefold. Reason one, the number of people in physical incarnation at this time who can work in a truly creative manner and profit by the information given in this rule is exceedingly few. Only to the white magician and he experienced in his work can the real interpretation be given. There is much danger in imparting the significance of these rules to those who are not qualified in themselves to work correctly. We will therefore consider the qualifications required of those who are entitled to this knowledge so that the student can begin to develop in himself that which may be lacking. The second reason, the danger of minute and detailed instructions consists in the fact that were they now to be given to the world, we should be flooded with thought forms and these thought forms would be created in order to express purely selfish desire and mental matter would be swept away into activity in line with the fancies, and the whims of the undeveloped along spiritual lines. It must be remembered that every human thought, whether the potent mass thoughts or individual dynamic ideas, must eventually emerge objectively on the physical plane. This is an inevitable and unalterable rule, and due consideration of this law which governs mental substance will show the danger of wrong thought and the power of right. The potency of human thought at this time is primarily of mass description, for few there are who can think creatively. Public opinion, mass ideas, the tendencies of human desire and thought are not at this time of the highest order, and the physical precipitation of these vague and inchoate thoughts, distinguished by a vast similarity and colored by selfish intent and personal behest, and based upon likes and dislikes, prejudices and longings, can be seen in the most interesting precipitation. The vast assembly of insects which now haunt our planet and cause increasing concern to the scientist, agriculturist, and all those dealing with the welfare of the human animal are the direct result of thought precipitation. I, dude, I think I just read this. I, I must have just read this in the last few days, actually. <laughs> and, and, and not. Um, you know why? Two reasons, and this is going to be funny, why my initial statement about this came up. I was looking at masses. So over here, it says mass ideas, mm -hmm. right? So I had looked for, searched masses. And then, you know, the other day I had this question about insects. 
because there's just so I'm like, where does this fit in mm -hmm. to uh, this whole thing? Where where do I put this these insects at? You know, and, and I'm not going to go reading. I don't feel like reading the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall all through again. I had read that at one point uh, about insects, but um, a lot of these are. It, he says. If it's not in this section, is what I want to tell you about insects. Uh, predators of this earth are are will be removed systematically. Hmm. So predators of danger, like uh, anything, a, a, even animal predators and human predators, and insect pre are going to be shifted uh, out. Hmm. Super wild. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Interesting. No, yeah. that was a good thought. Um, where, okay. So I have not time to enlarge upon this fact, but I can assure you that as men learn to think with more unselfishness and with greater purity, and as malice and hatred and competition give place to brotherhood, kindness, and cooperation, the insect pest, as it is now called, will most surely die out. All right, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and the third reason why this is most difficult for DK to explain is another difficulty which I experienced in elucidating these rules lies in the fact that it is today more easy to prove the fact that there is a realm of mind than it is to prove that there is a realm of the ether, even though scientists use the word widely. This rule concerns the four grades of etheric substance, which constitute the etheric envelope of all forms and nature, from a mountain to an ant, and from a plant to an atom. Certain scientists recognize the fact of an etheric body. Vast numbers do not. And from the standpoint of the masses of humanity, it remains unrecognized. That which lies closest to us and in our immediate foreground is often overlooked. And it has interested those of us who teach and guide to note how much emphasis is laid upon psychic and astral phenomena and how little attention is paid to the more obvious and more easily discerned etheric forms and forces. Given a slight change in the present mode of visual focusing, it will be found that the human eye is capable of including an entirely new field of perception and of awareness. Blindly men introvert their unconsciousness and become aware of astral objects and that elus elusive world of ever-changing forms in which we live and move and have our being, and yet they fail to see that which lies immediately before them. These three difficulties of one, lack of qualification, two, dangers inherent in unconscious form building, and three, etheric blindness, make it well nigh impossible for me to do full justice to this rule and to elucidate the work on etheric levels, and hence the relative brevity of the elucidation. In dealing with the subject of qualification and answering the question, what constitutes the equipment needed by a white magician? I would say one thing. All students realize that certain requirements must be met if a man is to be entrusted with any measure of understanding of the technique of the great work. I take it for granted, however, that the character qualifications are not those to which our question refers. All aspirants know, and down the agents have been taught, that a clean mind and a pure heart, love of truth, and a life of service and unselfishness are prime prerequisites, and where they are lacking, naught avails and none of the great secrets can be imparted. You might well say here, we have also been taught that there exist those who work in the four ethers and who undoubtedly perform magical deeds, yet who do not possess this essential purity and loving kindness to which reference has been made. This is undoubtedly true. They belong to a group of workers in matter whom we call black magicians. They are highly developed intellectually and can motivate mental substance or mind stuff in such a manner that it can achieve objectivity on the physical plane and bring about their deep intent. About this group, there is much misunderstanding and profound ignorance. It is perhaps as well, for their destiny is tied up with the future race, the sixth, and their end, 
and their end and the cessation of their activities will come about in that far distant aeon, which is technically called the sixth round. The final break or division between the so-called black and white forces for this particular world cycle will take place during the period of the sixth root race in the present round. Towards the close of the sixth root race, before the emergence, oops, just lost my place there. It's just, uh, towards the close of the sixth root race, before the emergence of the seventh, we shall have the true Armageddon about which so much has been taught. A small cycle corresponding to this final battle and cleavage will appear during the sixth sub race, which is now in process of formation. The world war, which just has taken place in our present cycle of separativeness and upheaval, do not constitute the real Armageddon. The war, which is told to us in the Mahabharata and the present war, had the roots of their trouble and the seeds of the disasters which they brought about. One in the lower and one in the higher astral world. Selfishness and desire of a low order were the impulses back of them both. The coming great division will have its roots in the mental world and will consummate in the sixth subrace. In the sixth root race, it will have the seeds of portentous disaster and the coordinated triplicity of mind, astralism, and physical nature, which will bring about a climaxing moment for the planetary duality. Beyond that, we need not go, for the humanity of the sixth round will be so different in nature to ours that those who will differentiate into the black and the white forces will be so unlike what we now understand by the words that we need not concern ourselves with that far distant problem. Let it be remembered that the true black magician, I refer not here to a person with a tendency to black magic, is a soulless entity. He is a being in whom the ego is, as we understand the term today, non-existent. It is oft overlooked and seldom grasped or told that they, therefore, do not exist in physical bodies. Their world is ever the world of illusion. They work from the lower mental plane on desire matter and on the sentient desire bodies of those on the physical plane who are swept by delusion and held in the bonds of extreme selfishness and self-centeredness. What the ignorant call a black magician on the physical plane is only some man or woman sensitive to or on rapport with a true black magician on the astral plane. This relationship is only possible when there have been many lives, <laughs> many lives of selfishness, low desire, perverted intellectual aspiration and love of the lower psychism, and this only when the man has been held willingly in thrall by them. Such men and women are few and far between, for, un for unadulterated selfishness is rare indeed. Where it exists, it is exceedingly potent, as are all one-pointed tendencies. The clue to the requirements of a more esoteric kind is given to us in Rule 13. The magician must recognize the four. He has presumably built up a fine character. He has educated himself for service. His aspiration is true and steady. He is living purely and unselfishly. He has mastered somewhat the meaning of meditation. He now has to begin to train himself in what is called occult recognition. This rule is a most interesting example of the many connotations and numerous correspondences which can be conveyed in a few simple words. We are told that he must recognize the four. The treatise on cosmic fire tells us, this means literally that the magician must be in a position to discriminate between the different ethers and to note the special hue of the different levels thereby ensuring a balanced building of the shadow. He recognizes them in the occult sense. That is, he knows their note and key and is aware of the particular type of energy they embody. Enough emphasis has not been laid upon the fact that the three higher levels of the etheric plane are in vibratory communication with the three higher planes of the cosmic physical plane. And they, with their ensphering fourth level, have been called in the occult books the inverted tetra, tetra, tetractus. 
That's like a. Isn't that a tractus? Isn't that like a triangle of some sort? Yeah, I've looked at. Uh, I've looked it up before. Actually, <clears throat> Isn't that like the triangle that has ten points, starting with four at the base to the three to the two to the one. It has some significance, I think, in the Pythag Pythagorean theory or something like that. Ten points arranged in four rows, one, two, three, and four points in each row, which is the geometrical representation of the fourth triangular number. Uh, the tetractus was an, illusion, uh, an illustration of existence of the way everything is structured in the universe by the Pythagoreans. Mm. Okay, so there we uh, go. Yeah, so <laughs> if we look at that, one, two, three, four, two, three, yeah, uh, you know, and it, it's like, you know, it could fit into the, uh, Our chart is is way sufficient, I think. You know, I don't know. Well, here it refers to as a, as inverted, so I don't know, but that might be. Uh, this came out know. of our treatise on cosmic fire, so that might be some side research there. But anyway, um, so. Uh, communication of these three higher planes of the cosmic physical plane and they with the inspiring fourth level have been called in the occult books the inverted tetric tetractus it is this knowledge which puts the magician in possession of the three types of planetary force and their combination or the fourth type and thus releases for him that vital energy which will drive this idea into object objectivity as the different types of forces meet and coalesce a dim shadowy form clothes itself upon the vibrating astral and mental sheath, and the idea of the solar angel is attaining definite concretion. So that all came out of cosmic fire. The obvious and most apparent meaning is therefore recognition of the four ethers, but this is in its turn dependent upon other meanings and based upon the recognition of other quaternaries. I would like to give a short resume of some of the qualifications needed by the white magician and some of the recognitions which will gradually emerge in his consciousness. First, he must recognize that the four that constitute the one. In other words, the first quaternary that he must know and know well is that which he is essentially himself, one, physical body, sensitive emotional nature, mind and soul, two, soul, mind, brain, and the outer world of forces, and three, spirit, soul, and body within the great whole. This presupposes real spiritual attainment and the capacity, therefore, to function as a soul. Until this has been achieved, one can be an aspirant to the practice of white magic, but one is not yet a white magician. Second, he must recognize the city that stands four square. He must understand the meaning of man, the cube, and this in three ways. One, himself as a human being. Two, his fellow man in relation to himself and the whole. Three, the fourth kingdom in nature, the human kingdom, viewing that entire kingdom as an entity, an organized life functioning on the physical plane, indwelt by soul, and animated by spirit. This means, therefore, that as a man, he is responsive to his kind and is aware also of the purpose of the kingdom to which he belongs. This can best be expressed in some wonderful words from an ancient writing in the Master's archives. It is said to date back to early Atlantean times. The material on which the writing is found is so old and so frail that all that that all that the masters themselves can touch and see is a precipitation made from it, the original being kept at Shambhala. It runs thus with certain deletions, which it is wiser not to insert. 
So unquote, at the four corners of the square, the four angelic are seen. Orange they are, but veiled in rosy light. Within each form, the yellow flame is seen, and round each form, the blue. Four words they utter forth, one for each human race, but not the sacred sound which bringeth forth the seventh. Two words have died away, four sound today. One sounds in realms so high that man can enter not as man. Thus are the seven words of man ringing around the square, passing from mouth to mouth. Each day of man, the words take form and different seem. In the words will be as follows. From out the north, a word is chanted forth, which means be pure. From out the south, the word, word peels out, I dedicate and. From out the east, bringing a light divine, the word comes swinging round the square, love all. From out the west, answer is thrown back, I serve. This is a faint effort to express in English these ancient Atlantean phrases, older than Sanskrit or Senzar, and known only to a mere handful of the members of the present hierarchy. But in the thoughts of purity, dedication, love, and service are summed up the nature and the destiny of man, and it should be remembered that they do not stand for so-called spiritual qualities, but for potent occult forces, dynamic in their incentive and creative in their results. This should be pondered on carefully by all aspirants. We have consequently with these four added to the first one, spiritual attainment, five of the qualifications of the white magician. Third, the white magician must recognize the cross which stands in the heaven, in the heavens upon which the cosmic Christ is crucified, and on which the white magician, being a cell in the body of the cosmic Christ, is also crucified. Technically and astrologically speaking, in this present eon, he must understand the inner significance of Taurus, of Leo, of Scorpio, and of Aquarius, for they are potent in our world cycle. He must, if I may express it symbolically, and yet at the same time accurately, be able to utter forth the achievement which is the goal of his endeavor in each of these four signs and under each of these four powers. In Taurus, he must be able to say, I seek illumination and am myself the light. In Leo, he will say, I know myself to be the one. I rule by law. The word he will utter forth in Scorpio will be, illusion cannot hold me. I am the bird that flies with utter freedom. And in Aquarius, the word spoken will be, I am the server and I, the dispenser, am of living water. These occult qualifications upon which I have thus lightly touched must be closely studied by the aspirant, and as he studies them and lives by these rules, various qualifications will emerge and will distinguish him. It must be remembered that all that I have here said has a different meaning on each plane and in relation to the seven stages of consciousness, as these express themselves in these seven fields of awareness. Finally, as far as the aspirant who reads the instructions is concerned, he must have transcended the four noble truths, learned the meaning of the four gospels, understood the significance and purpose of the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, and esoterically speaking, passed as a savior through the four kingdoms. This latter phrase will only be really understood at the fourth initiation. Uh, and he, yes. So, you know, I'm always just bouncing everything off of the chart. <clears throat> um, so we look at Taurus and it's physical, right? And if, can you go back up just slightly? Yeah, while we were talking about this. Right here. Um, so I would say we're looking here at 
these four planes of the human. And that's a square, right? They create the square, right? Mm -hmm. On the zodiac. And would be, so yeah. Uh, so earth, water, fire, air. So we're looking at, uh, you know, ev evolutionary evolution in a, in a way and um, pretty, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't go much further than that, but you just see that it can be understood, mm -hmm. you know, it's there, it's, uh, it fits. Uh, and there's the fourth. All right. Yes. And, you know, and it's said a lot, you know, you're, we're in the square, right? And when the square is unfolded, it turns into the cross. Mm. If, you un if you unfold the square, literally, right. it turns into the cross. Now, I think Annie Besant or uh, uh, studying consciousness or something would be a good place to look at that because she discusses, you know, the philosopher's stone essentially, right? Because you have mm. the circle inside the square and try you know, all that. So anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want, we can, we can look at this chart all the time and uh, it's usually there, the connections. Mm -hmm. The latter phrase will only be understood at the fourth initiation. When he has done this, he can say, desire holds me not, with freedom now I stand, I desire all and nothing, I live and die, am offered up and rise again, I come and go at will, earth lies beneath my feet, and water laves my form. The fire destroys that which impedes my way, and master of the air am I. Through all the world of forms my feet have passed, all now exist for me, and I the servant of the whole persists. Study these words and note how the concept of the ideal requirements which constitute the equipment of the white magician has steadily grown. I could enlarge on many other quaternaries, but the few just quoted suffice to show some of the recognitions towards which the aspirant strives. The only other one which I will note is that referred to as the violet four. For the four types of energy which constitute the vital or etheric body of all forms in the natural world. Here again, we have a higher three and a lower one, which ever indicates the three aspects or principles of divinity and the form through which these three must manifest. Spirit, soul, and body express the same idea from another angle, added to that which is produced through their interaction. It must ever be remembered that form the point of view of reality, what we call the dense physical body, tangible and objective, is but an illusion. We are told again and again in the ancient writings that it is not a principle. Why is this so? Because it is only an appearance brought about by the merging of the higher three and the fourth. This appearance is a fiction or a figment of the human mind. I speak not in parable. <laughs> hey hey hello i'm not kidding i'm not kidding it's an illusion wait what yeah i said i'm not kidding it's not a fiction it's a figment of your imagination uh, i utter only facts in nature and one that is slowly coming into mature consideration among the philosophers of both hemispheres both in the solar system, the macrocosm of the microcosm, and likewise in the microcosm, there are ever the three highest planes, which embody the principles and produce the dynamic purpose, and which constitute the four levels of the etheric body of both God and man, viewing them from what we call the energy or physical angle. These four are reflected in the four levels of the etheric division of the physical plane, as regards the physical body of all forms. These four etheric levels, or these four grades of vital substance, constitute what is called the true form of all material objects or phenomena, 
and they are responsive to the four higher types of spiritual energy, which we usually call divine. This relation between the prototypal trinity and its plane of merging and the etheric reflection is found in all forms according to the type of energy which predominates. In each of the four kingdoms in nature, all four types are found, but the fourth etheric is found in fuller degree in the mineral kingdom than in the human. Whilst the highest of the four ethers is found in greater proportion in the human than in the other three kingdoms. This which I tell you is apt to be found confusing by the neophyte for the words, energy, dynamic purpose, vitality, and etheric substance mean little to the beginner. But they serve to indicate some of the knowledge which the worker in white magic has to grasp. This I might illustrate, for instance, by stating that working in the mineral kingdom, the fourth kingdom in nature from the standpoint of God, and the first from the standpoint of time and space, he will work with the fourth cosmic ether, the buddhic energy, utilizing ether of the fourth grade in his own body as the transmitting agent, and so on in connection with the other three kingdoms in nature. One of the secrets not yet revealed, fortunately, is concerned with the question as to whether light violet is the color of the highest or the lowest of the four, and this will not be revealed for some time to come. The consideration of these various quaternaries, which it is necessary that the white magician understand, and the qualifications which he must possess before he is permitted to carry forward the magical work, leads to the following question. Is there some basic formula or proposition which must govern the magical activity? This question is, of course, too general and vague, but until the inclusiveness of the human mind is greater than is now the case, such questions will inevitably be asked. I can, however, give a short reply which holds in it the clue to the entire process. When correctly understood, it will govern the method of work and the thought life of the worker in white magic. My answer is this. Potencies produce precipitation. In those three words lies the entire story. They sum up the history of the creator and the life story and environing conditions of every human being. They account for all that is and lie back of the law of rebirth. These potencies are driven into activity by the power of thought, and hence in training them to be creators and in teaching them to govern and control their own de destinies, the teachers of the race begin with the mind aspect of aspirants. They emphasize that which will govern the potencies, they deal with that which produces the objective form, which is qualified by them, is energized by them, and which fulfills the purpose of the thinker. A thinker, then, is the essential factor, and it will become apparent to you, therefore, as you study these words, just what is going on in the world of today. The trend of our modern civilization, in spite of all its mistakes and errors, is to produce thinkers. Education, books, travel, in its many and varied forms, enunciations of science and of philosophy, and the driving inner urge which we call religious, but which is in fact the drive towards truth and its mental verification, all these factors have one objective, and this is to produce thinkers. Given a real thinker, you have an, an incipient creator, and unconsciously at first, but consciously later on, one who will wield power in order to precipitate or cause to emerge objective forms. These forms will either be in line with divine purpose and plan and consequently will further the cause of evolution, or they will be animated by personal intent, characterized by separated selfish purpose and constitute therefore part of the work of the retroactive forces and the material element. They will be of the nature of black magic. Again, the four appear. <clears throat> One, the thinker. Two, the potency. Three, the quality of that potency. And four, the precipitation. That concludes the first subsection of Rule 13. 
Mm. Looks uh, like we as you're reading that, sir. Yeah. And if we sit back <clears throat> as the observer and look at this, how incredible it is that we are reading this in form um, and both in form and as an observer. Right. <laughs> Uh, and it's just amazing when you uh, when we really dig into as thinkers, right? Because certainly, if you're reading this, uh, you are a thinker uh, and being trained as such on a in, in you know a very incredible level of that, I would say. So just to be sitting here with this mathematics. Um, looking out at the screen to be seeing this and receiving this training into the lower worlds, into the brain, you know, and in, into the physical is quite the gift at this stage, I would say. Wow. It's not fully a, uh, you know, this is a, an advanced type of thing. You're in the advanced class. You know, it's really incredible. I don't know how to put that into all the words that I was trying to, but but that's what had come across. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. It's one thing to be spiritual. It's another thing to be on the physical plane and reading about this stuff is what I'm saying. You know? Right. I'm learning this uh, instead of how to you know, go fish or play baseball or something. Or what, you know. Well, even therein, though, there's probably expectation of a certain level of mental thinking involved. But anyway, oh no, it's all it's all appropriate. But I'm just but, thinking, what a, what a gift! I, you so I as uh, as I read that bit about fulfilling the purpose of the thinker. Does that at all negate so the, the conversation you were ha you and I were having earlier before we? started the video about not thinking <laughs> and just being comfortable uh this is um uh, this is this is white magic so this is uh this in, does involve the mental plan and uh, thought form building and all the above, you know, right. meditation and, uh, you know, but, but also as we get comfortable in these things and learn them and build it into the system, I, I want to say it, it becomes fully natural at some point. It's like no longer, nature. right? Yeah. It, it, right now, we're, you know, this is part of it or whatever. But I, I want to say, you know, and I'm sure he'll explain this in, yeah. in this section, actually. You know, what we're getting at here. No, it's good questions, so though. I mean, sure. I think there might be a differentiation between just standard thinking and intelligent thought, too. So, but we'll see. Let's see what he says. So yeah, we got about nine pages. I'm just going to keep pushing forward if you don't mind. I know we've probably already been reading for about 40 minutes, but let's go. Let's do it. I think we can rip through these nine pages. We'll see. The precipitation of thought forms. What is a precipitation? Many definitions could be given, and most of them being clothed in words would lose much of their true significance. But some idea may be conveyed in the following terms. A precipitation is an aggregation of energies arranged in a certain form in order to express the idea of some creative thinker, and qualified or characterized by the nature of his thought and held in that peculiar form as long as his thought remains dynamic. These words are an attempt to express a symbol found in the same ancient book, or rather compilation, referred to earlier in our consideration of Rule 13. 
Certainly, these symbols emerging from the remote past constitute the working tools, if I might so express it, of the thinkers who guide our racial and planetary evolution. This particular symbol might be described as follows. A blazing sun forms the background, and at the very center of that sun appears an eye. Projecting downwards toward the right from this eye pours forth a stream of energy in the form of a beam of light. It rays outward, widening towards the end into a second circle, and in that circle is a cross resembling what is called a Maltese cross. At the center of the cross is another eye. Within the eye, the sacred word. Between the arms of the cross forming, therefore, another cross is the swastika, the arms emerging from behind the Maltese cross. At the bottom of the page whereon this symbol is found are four geometrical forms. Some of these are referred to by Blavatsky, HPB, and were taken by her from this ancient picture. They are well known, but seldom applied by esotericists to the creative work. They are the cube, the five-pointed star, the six-pointed star, and the eight-sided diamond superimposed one upon the other. They constitute, therefore, the base of the symbol. HPB refers also to the point, the line and the circle, but these with the triangle have been exoterically applied to deity and the manifested universe. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Later, these other forms will also be applied to God and to man in the exoteric sense. But this will only be when the truths of the ageless wisdom are universally recognized. The laws of thought are the laws of creation, and the entire creative work is carried forward on the etheric level. This constitutes practically a second formula. The creator of the solar system confines his attention to the work performed on what we call the four higher planes of our system. The lower three constituting the cosmic density dense physical plane are in the nature of precipitation. They are objective because the matter of space responds to or is attracted by the potency of the four higher etheric vibrations. These in their turn are motivated or swept into activity by the dynamic impact of the divine thought. There is a similar procedure where man is concerned. As soon as man becomes a thinker and can formulate his thought, desire its manifestation and can energize by recognition the four ethers, a dense physical manifestation is inevitable. He will attract by his pranic energy, colored by a desire high or low, and animated by the potency of his thought, just as much of the responsive matter in space as is needed to give body to his form. Much of this is dealt with in a treatise on cosmic fire, and as these instructions are intended to deal with the inner development of the aspirin, I shall not carry these ideas further beyond prophesy, prophesying with that within 50 years, the true significance and precipitations, which will, which significance of precipitations will be engrossing the attention of the scientists. Occult students would do well to give the subject careful thought. It can be approached in two ways. There is first of all, the study of the objective world, in which the individual aspirant finds himself. He will need to consider the fact that his body of manifestation is a precipitation, that it is a result of his potent thought and desire and of his recognition of the four ethers. He will need to understand that this form which he has created will persist just as long as the dynamic power of his thought holds it together and that it will dissipate when he, occultly speaking, takes his eye away. He will need to consider also that his environment is the result of the work of an aggregate of group thinkers, group to which he belongs. This concept can be traced back all the way from a family group to the group of egos who closely interlinked form a group on the higher level of the mental plane, and on again to the seven major thinkers of the universe, the lords of the seven rays. These seven in their turn are swept into activity 
by the three supreme magical workers, the manifested trinity. These three, in due course, will be recognized as responsive to the thought of the one creator, the unmanifested logos. Further, the word recognition is one of the most important in the language of occultism and holds the clue to the mystery of being. <clears throat> it is related to karmic activity and on it the lords of time and space depend. It is hard to illustrate this in simple terms, but it might be said that the problem of God himself consists in this, that he must manifest a threefold recognition. First, recognition of the past, which necessarily involves a recognition of that matter and space, which is, through past association, already colored by thought and purpose. Two, recognition of the four grades of lives, which, again, through past association, are capable of response to his new thought for the present and can therefore carry out his plans and work in collaboration with him. They subject their individual purpose to the one divine plan. And three, recognition of the objective which exists in his mind. This, in its turn, necessitates a one-pointed focusing upon the goal and the holding of the purpose intact throughout the vicissitudes of the creative work, and in spite of the potency of the, many, of the many divine thinkers who have been attracted to him by similarity of idea. It is hopeless to attempt to avoid the use of personal pronouns when talking pictorially and symbolically. If the student will bear in mind that such an attempt to reduce cosmic principles and concepts to words is in itself ridiculous and that the only possible thing to do is to present a picture, then no harm can eventuate. But the picture changes as evolution proceeds upon its way, and the picture of today will at a later date be deemed no better than a child's rough scrawl. A new picture will then be presented, simpler and more harmonious and more beautiful, until it, in its turn, is deemed inadequate. The same recognitions on a lesser scale govern the activities of the solar angel as he proceeds with the work of incarnation and of manifestation upon the physical plane. He has, in his turn, to recognize the matter of the three planes of human expression, which are already through past association, colored by his vibration. He has to recognize the groups of lives with which he has had relation and, which, and with which he again must work. Finally, he has, throughout the tiny cycle of an incarnation, to hold his purpose steady and to see that each life carries that purpose forward into fuller manifestation and completion. The work of a human being also, as he endeavors to become a creative thinker, lies along analogous lines. His creative work will be successful if he can recognize the tendency of his mind as that tendency emerges through the medium of his present interests, for these have their roots in the past. It will be successful if he can recognize the vibration of the group of lives in line with whose, with whose thought his creative work must proceed, for unlike the deity in the solar system, he cannot work soul and alone. And who shall say whether in those greater spheres of existence in which our deity plays his part, he is any more free from cosmic group influences than the human individual is free from impression by his environing impulses. He has to recognize the purpose for which he has deemed it wise to build a thought form, and he must hold that purpose steady and unimpaired throughout the whole period of objectivity. This we call one-pointed attention, and this creative work is one of the as yet unrecognized goals of the meditation process. Hitherto, the emphasis has been laid on the achieving of a focused attention and on the necessity, when that has been attained, of coming in touch with the soul, the spiritual thinker. But the later decades will see the emerging of a technique of creation. When soul, mind, and brain are unified, and facility and unification has been achieved, further instructions will be given in the creative art. Meditation is the first basic lesson given when men have achieved the capacity to function on the mental plane. Down the great cycle upon the wheel of rebirth, 
the idea of the solar angel is attaining definite concretion. A treatise on cosmic fire, see page 10, 1024. Each life sees the initial purpose. Clarified in time is literally the length of a thought. The same basic truth underlies the creation of all forms on the physical plane. Whether it is a thought form embodying the urgent desire of a man for selfless acquisition, or that thought form which we call a group or an organization, and which is animated by the unselfish purpose and embodies one disciple's mode of helping humanity. It underlies group work regarding a group as an entity. If a group could appreciate the power of this fact and recognize its opportunity, it could, by its one-pointed fixity, fixity of purpose and its focused attention to the spiritual objective, perform miracles in salvaging the world. I here appeal to all who read these words to, re, to reconsecrate themselves and to recognize the opportunity they have of, an, of a united effort towards world usefulness. It might be of use here if I express quite simply the requirements needed to bring about the manifestation of individual spiritual purpose or of group spiritual purpose. These can be summed up in three words. One, power. Two, detachment. And three, non-criticism. So often simple words are used because of their everyday connotation, their true significance and esoteric value are lost. Let me give you a few thoughts and then each of these, which with application only to the creative work of white magic. Power is dependent for expression upon two factors. A, sing singleness of purpose and B, lack of impediments. Students would be amazed if they could see their motives as we see them who guide on the subjective side of experience. M mixed motive is universal. Pure motive is rare, and where it exists, there is ever success and achievement. Such pure motive can be entirely selfish and personal, or unselfish and spiritual, and in between, where aspirants are concerned, mix in varying degree. According, however, to the purity of intent and the singleness of purpose, so will be the potency. The master of all the masters has said, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. These words which he enunciated give us a principle underlying all the creative work, and we can link up the idea which he clothed in words with the symbol I have earlier described in this treatise. Power, light, vitality, and manifestation. Such is the true procedure. It will be obvious, therefore, why the manifested unit, man, is urged to be vital in his search and to cultivate his aspiration. When that aspiration is strong enough, he is then urged to achieve the capacity to hold his mind steady in the light. When he can do this, he will achieve power and possess that single eye which will redound to the glory of the indwelling divinity. Before, however, he has mastered this process of development, he may not be trusted with power. The procedure is as follows. The individual aspirant begins to manifest somewhat soul purpose in his life on the physical plane. He is transmuting desire into aspiration, but that aspiration is vital and real. He is learning the meaning of light. When he has mastered the technique of meditation, and with this certain schools and existence at present are concerned, he can proceed to handle power because he will have learned to function as a divine thinker. He is now cooperative and is in touch with the divine purpose. As all true students know, however, the number of impediments is legion. Hindrances and obstacles abound. Singleness and purpose may occasionally be realized in high moments, but it does not abide with us always. There are hindrances of physical nature, of heredity and environment, of character, of time and conditions, of world karma, as well as individual karma. What, shen, what shall then be done? I have only one word to say, and that is persist. Failure never prevents success. Difficulties develop the strength of the soul. The secret of success is ever to stand steady and to be impersonal. 
The second requirement is detachment. The worker in white magic must hold himself free as much as he can from identifying himself with that which he has created or has attempted to create. The secret for all aspirants is to cultivate the attitude of the onlooker and of the silent watcher. And may I emphasize the word silent. Much true magical work comes to naught because of the failure of the worker and builder in matter to keep silent. By premature speech and too much talk, he slays that which he has attempted to create. The child of his thought is still born. All workers in the field of the world should recognize the need for silent detachment and the work before every student who reads these instructions must consist in cultivating a detached attitude. It is a mental detachment which enables the thinker to dwell ever in the high and secret place and from that center of peace calmly and powerfully to carry out the work he has set before himself. He works in the world of men. He loves and comforts and serves. He pays no attention to his personality, likes and dislikes, or to his prejudices and attachments. He stands as a rock of strength and as a strong hand in the dark to all whom he contacts. The cultivation of a detached attitude personally, with the attached attitude spiritually, will cut at the very roots of a man's life, but it will render back a thousandfold for all that it cuts away. I know we talked about that earlier. <laughs> Much has been written in that attachment and the need to develop detachment. May I beg all students in the urgency of the present situation to leave off reading and thinking about it aspirationally and to begin to practice it and demonstrate it. Non-criticism is the third requirement. What shall I say about that? Why is it regarded as so essential a requirement? Because criticism, analysis, and consequently separativeness is the outstanding characteristic of mental types and also of all coordinated personalities. Because criticism is a potent factor in swinging mental and emotional substance into activity and so making strong impress upon the brain cells and working out into words. Because in a sudden burst of critical thought, the entire personality can be galvanized into a potent coordination, but of a wrong kind and with disastrous results. Because criticism being a faculty of the lower mind can hurt and wound, and no man can proceed upon the way as long as wounds are made and pain is knowingly given. Because the work of white magic and the carrying out of higher hierarchical purpose meets with basic hindrances in the relations existing between its workers and disciples. In the pressure of the present opportunity, there is no time for criticism to exist between workers. They hinder each other and they hinder the work. I have upon, I have upon me at this time a sense of urgency. I urge upon all those who read these instructions to forget their likes and their dislikes and to overlook the personality hindrances which inevitably exist in themselves and in all who work upon the physical plane handicapped by the personality. I urge upon all workers the remembrance that the day of opportunity is with us and that it has its term. This present type of opportunity will not last forever. The pettiness of the human frictions the failures to understand each other, the little faults which have their roots in personality and which are, after all, ephemeral, the ambitions and illusions must all go. If the workers would practice detachment, knowing that the law works and that God's purpose must come to an ultimate conclusion, and if they would learn never to criticize in thought or word, the salvaging of the world would proceed a space a pace, and the new age of love and illumination would be ushered in. And there concludes Rule 13. Very powerful towards the end there. You're muted. Yeah, this is the teachings, um, you know, be silent. Uh, this is the teachings of the Buddha. This is, 
you know, when, when the Bible says don't judge, I mean, uh, practice detachment, dispassion. Yeah. Um, this is yoga. This is Buddha. This is every, this is everything wrapped up in one in this last couple paragraphs here. Um, and the way to do it for the viewer that's watching this is through knowledge of the need to do this. Mm -hmm. Once we have the knowledge of it, we're working in that direction because from this point on, you can't not, you can't help but catch yourself every time that you begin to judge. And then if you can catch yourself, and, and, and this is knowledge, if you if we're catching ourselves, and then we, the next time it comes around and we're about to blabber something out, you may be more li likely to not blabber it out. And then you caught yourself when you do blabber it out later again on accident because you then realized it did change your environment and you right. don't, it's not good. It has no benefit. So yeah, we're learning through experience that this is also the case. And then through experience, we learn not to criticize. You can't just say if that's in your personality, don't criticize without learning why not to. But now we have the educational reason why, and then we'll have the experiential reason. And then you inevitably will just stop uh, to a certain extent, you know, to, you know, and what you just won't do it anymore. You know, it takes a long time, though. This is not something that happens, you know, overnight. This detachment and being the observer and, uh, you know, these are, these are, this is all, this is, this is good ways into the process, you know. It's, just, it's really incredible stuff. And then becoming silent and and then how silent is silence, you know? Right. And it's like, you know, well, it starts out by just being silent for, you know, a few seconds. Well, then I think Patanjali says um, to hold the mind steady for 12 seconds is, is a fantastic achievement, right? And then, uh, you know, from there, it's, I believe it's probably there for you at that point or, you know, thereafter. I don't know. It's a process. Yep. And one must persist. As it says you know, here. As we have. Yeah, man, you know, in our daily life, we have all sorts of predilections to things. And then, um, you know, our desire, you know, what we want our environment to feel like or look like, or we have these ideas of what other people's life should look like and what they should be doing and how our kids should act. And, um, well, that's part of what we need to detach ourselves from is the worry and kind of anticipation of what the result should be or needs to be. The point is, I think, having the singleness of purpose, like it says here, is the part of this power section and to be silent with it and just persist with it and not worry so much about, I guess, the outcome. This is a practice. This is a learned thing, you know, and it's well, learned it, in our daily environment and the crucible of daily living. Yeah. You know, uh, and then, you know, eventually the next thing, you know, you find yourself holding your tongue and holding your peace and keeping your peace and uh, not becoming involved in you know, something that you would normally have been involved in or some sort of emotional event that normally would have set you off. You say, oh, well, that, that did not trigger me 
And then you find, you know, gradually that things stop triggering you altogether because you have no attachment to the outcome like we're talking about. Right. And then when, uh, when we let people be who they are, you know, we're really letting them be who they are. Mm -hmm. And we're just being ourselves. So then it's, then the atmosphere is very relaxed and quiet and, uh, you know, like I was, like we were talking about your environment just becomes very, very peaceful. Yeah, detachment comes up, you know, continuous. It's it's always there, you know. This passion, detachment, non-attachment, however, you know, all these different ways to look right. at it. You know, non-criticism. You could just say don't judge, too. You know, that's being no, you know, that's don't and, and uh that's biblical as well. And when you yeah. as soon as we stop judging, you know, that. It doesn't take long for us to be, that's an extra freedom. It's a lot of freedom in that. So this is, um, yeah. Um, where was I going with this? Where, what, <clears throat> the, this power, when you, when you grab your own power and, and you finally, you know, when we stand up for ourselves, there's a lot of power in that too. Right. When we separate our, I don't want to say separate ourselves, when we, when we extricate ourselves from Ooh. the collective, right, there's a, there's a level of power, detachment, and non-criticism all wrapped up in pulling ourselves out of the collective and becoming more individualized. Well, that is the goal, and, there, and that's where we're supposed to be pointing ourselves in this, and as we read through these um you know with power you've in order to gain that you have to have a signal of purpose and lack of impediments um you have to be detached from all of this in a way and like you said we can't judge um but it's interesting because in order to gain all of this, there has to be a rebirth with everybody because we have been so um, conditioned to like find ourselves attached to things and have tendencies to be critical of others because there's some expectation of that when you go into the workplace that you have to basically judge those around you who are there to serve their purpose and so, so it's just my point is is that there needs to be a rebirth with everybody in order to kind of overcome these elements that are discussed here that are needed i think the rebirth part came when you know if you're reading this it probably already came yeah because you know, we're moving on. Oh, now. no doubt. No doubt. So this is possible. I'm just making the point that <clears throat> it's absolutely possible. <clears throat> but there's a level of difficulty for some to overcome that hump. You know, because, because we've all been so conditioned to be a certain way. Look at things a certain way, just over the process of time. And it's because we've been held back to a sense to keep us lower, hold us lower, and not achieve these higher levels, right? I'm just saying. Well, and and you've heard we've heard this, and, and I think you and I have probably heard this many, many, many times before by the hin by the Hindus or Buddhists or, or some of the sages and saints and whatnot. They say, "Don't be involved in the particulars, the consciousness of the observer, and the uh -huh. higher, more expanded levels of consciousness." Do not get into particulars. They deal, uh, it deals more, not even with meaning, because on the mental plane, we're looking for the meaning. We're looking at symbols, 
and we're we're kind of diff, you know discerning what these things mean on end of it, you know what does this part of our life mean what does that mean right but on the on the intuitional level we're not you're not looking at particulars we're looking at significance like uh because you're taking the whole thing into consideration at that point you're not looking at individual aspects of the thing and then you know on a higher you know we're removing one of the reflections i guess you could say mm -hmm. if that makes sense we're, we're we're not even looking at this reflection we're looking at it from a much broader zoomed out perspective and then we're even potentially looking at the reason and the logic logoic lo behind uh, what we're what we're looking at, or I guess you could say. So we go back and forth with this for a while, though, too. You know, it's not that it's not you know because for some of the day you spend time in particulars, and some of the day you end up being the observer, and then um, these things take time. And then some of the day, you know, you're dispassionate, you're non-critic, you know, you don't criticize, and you're in your power. And then uh, other times of the day. You lose it for a minute. You're, you know, you're in it. You're deep in the weeds. So we just recognize these things for a while. We become, you know, just constant awareness is what allows us to think our way out of this. I believe, you know, and eventually we do. You know, and you know, all these saints. And you know, if you listen to Mister Gurdada and these guys, you know, they say, you know. You know, and I and I, you know, we tell our kids, you know, this is a thinking man's game, and you have to think right. your way out of this. But we have to think our way out of it to get to non-thinking. Yep. Right. So, <laughs> it's like you, you think so hard that you break the thing, and now you don't think no more. You know, unless when, except you, then you begin to use the mind as a tool uh, in in this process. It becomes something that we're using now not something that we're being used by. So, yeah, it's good, man. It's good. It's, this is a powerful uh, chapter. Again, it always is. I was just going to say, every single one has been powerful. No idle words. <laughs> yeah, no idle words spoken here. All right. Well, I think yeah, that wraps deal. it up for this week. We'll pick up rule 14. We're nearing the end. I think, what is it? We've got two left, 14 and 15. So it looks like rule 14 is a bit on the long side. So we'll see where we get through with that next week. But Oh, well, we're getting pretty close to the end. We the are. We 15 are. rules, right? 15 rules. Yep. So. Yeah, we only have, what? look at that. 561 of 597. So that's, yeah, that's a good 36, 36 pages. pages. So yeah. doubt we'll get through that in one session, but we'll see. <laughs> so we've, I'm All right, not buddy. even, I guess this, we'll take it in stride. All right, man. As yeah, always, good. it's been Happy enlightening. Happy Mother's Day yep, yes. to everybody. Yep. Happy Mother's Same. Day. Your mom and wife and, and all the women of the world. Yeah. All right. All right. See you all next time.